Alrighty, folks, welcome back to the Break Time Podcast. This is a podcast for creating stock business and life. I'm your co-host, Lucas. I'm here with Vicky. Hey, guys. And Sam. Hey. And today, we actually have quite an incredible guest um, from GoPro to Samsung, from Corona. This guy works with so many brands. And funny enough, he's actually the first travel photographer that I ever followed when I started photography. Everybody, welcome Emmett Spiraling. Thanks for having me. Dude, thank you so much for being on here. Um, yeah, with that being said, I guess I'll just roll the intro like right here. Do it. <laughs> Alrighty, dude. So I see, I, I saw that you hurt your shoulder actually the other day. I was going to ask you how that's going. Yeah, I've got a nice little sling going on. Got three to six weeks with the, with the sling and then start shoulder re- rehab and hopefully it doesn't pop out again. Oh, what happened? So I was backcountry ski touring up by Mount Seymour um, and it was pretty slushy. It was like last week yeah. and um on our way back it was pretty dark and i hit this little like it was a pretty steep downhill and then a really steep uphill so it was a pretty big dip in the bottom and i was going pretty fast and i hit the dip a little too hard and kind of sat down you know when you hit a bump skiing and you sit down and but i'm still moving forward and then my pole got stuck in the slushy snow and my pole strap was on and it just ripped my arm out of its socket and it was it was just hang like my humerus bone which is what connects into your uh shoulder joint it's normally here but my you could feel the top of the bone it was more like hanging down here no my arm was just oh like God. just <laughs> flopping around and it was popped out for about an hour and it was just me and my two buddies and we had to like we called 911 called north shore rescue and they're both like, well, so we called 911 and they're like, call North Shore Rescue. So we call North Shore Rescue and they're like, call 911. <laughs> <laughs> so did you get a, heli- a helicopter? And no, everything? we ended up, we actually, so after both 911 and North Shore Rescue weren't very helpful, we uh, FaceTimed my, our buddy who has dislocated his shoulder more times than anyone I know. <laughs> And so we just FaceTimed him. He's like, yeah, just lie down on a like downward slope and like get your arm at a 45 degree angle and get someone to pull it and pop it back oh in. My God. <laughs> so Dude. they ended up like, we ended up doing that and it worked, which is nice. And the pain went from like, it was so painful. I couldn't even, I could hardly see. It was like, I couldn't stand up. I was just keeled over. And then when we popped it back in, the pain pretty much immediately went away. That's awesome. That's 10 out of 10, oh, like three out of 10. Damn, at least you could have got a helicopter ride out of it, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> got no shortage of helicopter rides. <laughs> yeah, you guys active in helicopters. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. So what, what does that mean for like, just like working for you right now? Are you just like using the other hand to snap photos and videos? Yeah, well, right now I like, it's my shooting arm. So I can't, I can't take ah. photos because all cameras are right handed. Um, so what I've been doing is I just attach a tripod to the bottom of my camera and then I can hold the tripod like that and then press all the buttons <laughs> with my other hand. So it's like, nice. well, there's a will, there's a way, as they say. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, time, so I, I see you're a, a Canon shooter, hey? Yeah. 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 We're, yeah. We're all, we're all Sony. <laughs> <laughs> no hard feelings. Yeah. They're both like, they're the two best for sure. Um, Hands down. The one thing that we keep saying though is like this summer, or like I don't know what it is, Sony won't let us enjoy one lens without bringing out a new one. It's like, man, like give me some time. Just chill out. Let me enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Canon, um, they're like at first when they started coming out with their mirrorless stuff, it was like pretty underwhelming with the EOS R and the RP. And apparently those were just test runs of their, of their more pro bodies, like the R5 and the R6, and then the R3 that's coming out. And then I think the R1 is coming out later in the year, at least it's rumored. 
Yeah. It's insane, yeah. insane what cameras can do now. I think now. Sony's yeah. just a little bit ahead of Canon right now in terms of the release schedule. Already, but also, like, I guess a, a great question to fire at you right off the bat is kind of just diving more more into that. So, like, your, like, whole passion for photography and, like, how it all, like, like how did it all start? Like, how did photography and video, making videos become a thing for you? Yeah, so I've been doing video longer than I've been doing photos. Um, so I started, um, like, I made my first, well, I've been making, like, little short films and home video style things since I was a kid um but like the very first taste of making videos was every year my whole family would um get together at Christmas and I come from a pretty creative family and we'd make like a stop motion video with like lego or claymation and stuff and we'd just make some big creative project and I was like probably eight years old doing that and then um eventually like so i've kind of got two different vi two different paths i got the video and photo i'll start with video so in grade nine in middle school um the middle school that i went to there's this project called masterworks and you basically are given this project you can choose any topic and you have to spend all year doing this there's a bit more structure than that but uh, basically the topic that i chose was i wanted to make a movie and so um we were learning about like pre-production, po uh, production, post-production. So I learned how to write a movie and then learned what actually went into making the movie and then editing the movie. Um, but I was in grade nine, so I was like 15, 14. And um, I chose a pretty ambitious pro ambitious project, but it, it was set in World War I. Um, and it was a film about the soldier. Uh, he gets shot in battle and wakes up as a kid and it, Turns out it was kids playing with uh, like with toy guns and stuff. And then um, at the end, one of the kids, um, so he gets shot, wakes up as a kid that had hurt his leg and his friends are kind of around him. Like, are you okay? Like what's wrong? And then as the kid stands up, he drops a trench journal out of his pocket. And then oh my God. <laughs> in and a soldier comes in and picks up the trench journal. So it was like kind of- this, That's so good. That's awesome. Like you don't know if the, kids or his imagination as he's dying and it's like angels taking him away or if it's the soldier is the kid's imagination kind of yeah. throws yeah. you for a loop like that i love that that's, a, that's an easy topic to choose when you're 15 <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like it looked like looking back at it now it looks really good it's just like i wish the filming quality was a bit higher it was shot mm -hmm. on a canon t4i and oh. <laughs> just all handheld stuff but it actually like the set design that we did just me and my buddy with shovels in a big like dug up muddy field and we had a big smoke machine and went to valley village and bought all our like all the world war one costumes yeah good old good old valley village always hooking up creatives with so much stuff o always <laughs> always delivers yeah hey you need something go to valley village yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're making like we're making the helmets out of paper mache and stuff and it was all very run and gun. So you guys just went all in. That's awesome. But that definitely gave me like the, that gave me the spark. I was like, damn, that was really fun. And it looked really cool at the end. And I just really enjoyed the feeling of everyone, like people watching it and being stoked on it. And then um, in grade 12, 11 and 12. So when I was, I guess you're seven, 16, 17, in grade 11 and 12. So I guess I was younger in grade nine then. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> 11 and 12, um, I decided to make this movie called Brain Maker. Um, it basically, so it follows the story of the, so the day before my parents announced they were pregnant with me, my dad had a seizure and was diagnosed with an inoperable malignant brain tumor. And how he coped with that was he imagined he was an astronaut. And so the story of the movie follows that story. It's half set in space in his imagination and half on earth in wow. reality and hospitals and stuff. Um, and so he's uh, 23 years clean of cancer now. That's nice. incredible. So, any, so he's yeah, fully back and everything. Um, and so it's like the movie's kind of over, like mind over mind over matter kind of thing. And um, it's all about mindset. And so for that film though, we like, we, 
put out an Indiegogo pitch, raised twenty twenty thousand dollars for the budget, nice. which sounds like a lot, but disappears so quickly. Yeah. Um, and then we were doing things like we built a full size Mercury space capsule in my backyard, um, and we like we turned my old middle school into a hospital. We rented a bunch of hospital equipment and just rigged it out. Um, what else were we doing? Yeah, we rented a spacesuit and like we we went pretty hard on that one um, and it looked really good. Awesome. And it was like, I think it was like a 20 minute film, but like there's so much I would change on it, how, on it now. But I think that film really taught me like what's actually possible with low budget filmmaking and what's a reasonable thing to try and tackle because I see so much now like teaching other people how they have these big ideas and really awesome story concepts and stuff but they're completely impossible to create if you don't have enough experience or budget or uh, resources so that was a really good learning experience for all of that um, and then also just learning how film festivals work and oh, sorry about that new place sorry the dog just barked but yeah it it was like, cause that film, since I was so young when I made it, it was, I was able to enter it in all the youth film festivals around Vancouver um, and in LA as well. So, um, cause you have to be under 18 for the youth film festivals and the movie, like looking back, like we shot it in 4K raw on a black magic and it, like it looks pretty sick. Um, and we have pretty good set design and stuff. Um, and the story of course is, is pretty moving. So yeah. um, we pretty much won every single award at every film festival we put it in. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. It, like the BC Student Film Festival, they called me up and then for the first award, and then they're like, just take a seat up at the front here. And then they handed me a box and then just started putting the trophies in the box. <laughs> <laughs> pretty crazy. That's so um, cool. But that was. That was the last time it was easy to win film festivals because yeah. I was suddenly out of the young age group. <laughs> but yeah, then over the last couple of years, I've just been working more and more on storytelling in a short form format. So three minute stories, mostly, because that's what a lot of brands are looking for. And it's also a really interesting time to play around with because three minutes can feel like a really long time if you don't do it properly. And it can be like, like it can feel really boring if it's just like a bunch of slow drone shots or something or the story is not quite there whereas if you get a really engaging story and really good visuals sound design three minutes will fly by like nothing so it's a really interesting time frame to play around with um because you can tell a full story in three minutes yeah i think the the last video that i that you made with the the air two like um that man you you killed that that was incredible yeah. and the funniest part about that the funniest part about that is that we were actually on sombrio beach when you were there <laughs> yeah oh, really yeah, yeah, yeah we yeah. were we were having a fire and like i saw on your story like a while later that you were posting that you were there like a day later or something i was like wait a second like we were there <laughs> when he was there and i'm like i'm very sure that i saw that jacket you're wearing yeah. too it's like, pretty bright so i was like man that's crazy that he's actually here when we were here we yeah. didn't even run into him we didn't even see him that's so funny yeah, um, small world yeah that was a that was a fun project um we basically just we were just like all right how many adventures can we do in a two-week period and then we just went full send and did everything like Jealous. ski touring paragliding uh helicopters and sailing and hiking mountain biking <laughs> just so cool. cool sand hey yeah. so hey so that means so 23 years that means you're 22 now mm -hmm. wow. wow that's crazy that's awesome man There's so many things you've done and so have you been a full-time videographer since you finished high school well so sorry i'm just gonna close my window um so I've done more photography for the um, beginning part of my, like, well, so basically I, after I did Brain Maker, I took a break from video for a bit because I was like, that was a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I was also really into fashion photography and taking portraits. Yeah. So I started taking photos of my friends and then one of my friends, she's a professional model. And so I took photos with her one day after school and um, this is still in high school. And then she showed those photos to her agency and her agency really liked them and um, started hiring me for more fashion shoots. So once I graduated high school, I had way more time to do all of that. Um, and then I spent the next like year or two years, um, just yeah, year and a half, two years doing pretty much new, like shooting with a new model every single day. Um, just trying to come up with creative portrait ideas and shooting editorials and stuff like that. So I did fashion photography for, for quite a, like it was only a year and a half or two years, but it was pretty much every day for that long. So it was a huge volume of stuff in a pretty short period of time. So it was a lot of practice and it was great, but the fashion industry has so many, so many strange people in it, <laughs> <laughs> like big egos and just people you don't necessarily want to hang out with all the time. <laughs> and so I decided to like, I just saved up a bit of money and then I went backpacking um, through Mexico and backpacking through Mexico like you're obviously not able to shoot any like professional models or like editorial stuff so I had to just learn how to do landscape photography and just started taking the worst landscape photos you've ever seen <laughs> and it was like yeah it was pretty brutal so I started I backpacked Mexico for four months and then um, I flew to Indonesia and backpacked through Indonesia for a bit but while I was in Indonesia, I had been messaging with George Hammond. He's another travel adventure photographer. And he and I, we both were at like 15,000 followers. And we just kind of reached out to each other. We were both kind of taking really bad landscape photos. But we were like, hey, we should like, let's connect. Let's backpack for a bit. And that was where things started to change because all of a sudden I had someone to bounce ideas off of and he and I really like, we kind of learned off each other because um, we were teaching each other as we went. And then we were also growing with each other because like we're both at like, he's at 700 and something thousand followers now. Yeah. So he and I grew together in the space and um, found a lot of those spots that you see in Bali and are like, we didn't find them, but we posted them on Instagram first and now everyone goes and copies them. But um, yeah, it was, it was really cool traveling with another photographer for the first time. And that really helped to help to grow my experience and um, kind of develop a style that way. Yeah. Um, I know uh, your, your family, like growing up, you, I've, I've seen you talk about how like they were act, active travelers and they're really adventurous and stuff. Would you say they're kind of like the influence that you had to really go out and travel more? Or did you always just want to go see more stuff? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. So um, my first Christmas after I graduated high school, my parents, my parents' Christmas present to me was a plane ticket to anywhere in the world. Oh, so nice. yeah, they're just Hell like, yeah. cause I was going to take a gap year and then go to film school, but I ended up just not going to film school and taking a bunch of, a bunch of gap years, excuse me. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I used that plane ticket to go from Mexico to Indonesia, um, cause that was the expensive one. <laughs> so yeah. That's so cool. So cool. So did you, so you, you mentioned, um, you go with somebody, how, how else do you find like other people to collab with or how does that work? Cause you collab with a lot of people, right? So how do you find those people? It's pretty much all Instagram. Like yeah? Instagram is the best tool for, for linking up with people with a like really similar mindset and just similar interests. Um, I would say all my best friends right now, I've met through Instagram, mm -hmm. which is pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. What I was going to say is I saw that on your, uh, your Zoom um, profile thing. That was the creator, the, what's it called? The, the creator circuit. Creator yeah. circuit, yeah. And uh, I, 
I saw sort of a bunch of sponsored ads in the last couple of weeks about it and noticed that you were part of it and had a few questions like, so you're an instructor on it. Did you co-create it or did, at all? Did you have any parts in, in doing that? Like wanted to hear more about that actually. Mm -hmm. So basically um, at the be beginning of the pandemic, um, we were, so I had a company called Triplet at the beginning of 2019 and we had an in-person workshop on Bowen Island. Um, went really well. We had some awesome instructors there. And then we started going down into the event space and started doing more in-person events and stuff and networking stuff. And then COVID hit and obviously you can't have an event company with COVID going on. So that kind of yeah. stopped everything. And so um, do you know Jacob Riglin? It's just at Jacob on Instagram. Yeah. 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 He, um, he and I kind of started brainstorming of some ideas of like, what could we do? It was kind of around that time where people were doing all those bundles. So yeah. the preset bundles and the workshop bundles and all that stuff. And it was like, you have a week sale and the creator makes a whole bunch of money and everyone else just gets like 150 presets that aren't great. And it's just like kind of a quick cash grab thing. So we were like, what can we do what can we make that would be more um, like have more longevity to it and be more meaningful and, and like useful for people that are trying to be creators in this space? Because that's ultimately the people that are buying all these products that people are making or that creators are making. And so we came up with the idea of Creator Circuit, which is a place kind of like a hub of a bunch of different workshops all in one with a whole bunch of different uh, creators. So or instructors. And so each we have currently 25 instructors, over 300 videos on there. Cool. And our, um, the, our main idea behind it was that current online workshops are too slow. And they're so boring. Like if you ever watch a photography tutorial, it's like half an hour to edit one photo. And you're like, how, like, this is so boring every yeah. single little step yeah. yeah yeah or you're in some or the instructors in some crazy location like shooting caribou with a 600 millimeter lens in the arctic and you're like this is teaching me absolutely this nothing is because i'm never <laughs> going to be i'm yeah. never going to yeah. be in that situation and so we came up with the concept of having every single video be 5 minutes or less so we instead of teaching like 10 topics in one half hour long video we just cut it down and have each video be one specific topic and just really go in on one topic. And you can actually fit a ton of information in a five minute video. And it's so much more engaging. We started adding uh, all like bloopers at the end of each video. So like we did a lot of research of what works best with online teaching. And one of the things we found was adding a little bit of humor every like 10 minutes can really like, can bring someone's attention in for an additional 10 minutes. So by having little bloopers in every other video, it just kind of, it's hilarious and it keeps people more motivated and it's funnier to watch. And we basically made it so you're able to just binge watch 300 videos if you wanted to. Um, but so yeah, we've got some awesome instructors on there um, and just cover all sorts of topics from business to uh, photography, video. Um, we have a whole thing called, I think it's called vision and it's uh, creativity and storytelling and or collaboration and storytelling. So we've got videos on all that and we've got a whole community side as well. So rather than just having a Facebook group where everyone can join, we actually have a community fully integrated into the website nice yeah and that was the other tricky part with it was we had to custom code the whole website so um i've hired my dad and his team who are web developers luckily <laughs> um and so they custom coded the whole website from scratch and it like to create a website that's able to host that many videos is a pretty challenging thing to do yeah, yeah. Yes. and then also have the community in there um because we wanted it to be when you sign up for creator circuit, you select your interests. Um, so if you're interested in landscape photography and social media and the, like turning your business into, or turning your hobby into a business or something like that, you can select your interests when you're signing up and then you get a custom feed of videos when you get into creator circuit. 
Um, and there was no platform available to really give us that ability. So we had to custom code it. Yeah, that's not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> that's definitely not cheap. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm um, like talking about like education and like, obviously like you do tons, which I think is really cool. I, like a big thing for us too, is we kind of like to teach other freelancers how to kind of get more full time with what they're doing. Cause there's like, Oh, not a ton of information out there, but it's also not like the hardest thing in the world, but becoming a travel photographer, I know definitely is definitely is harder. And it's definitely more of like a saturated niche because way more people want to do it because it's the coolest lifestyle ever. So how did, how did you actually pivot your entire, like, I guess, persona more into like working with bigger brands on like adventure outdoor travel stuff? Cause it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool watching like, or hearing how your life kind of changed around, but you kind of just seemed like you just went and took photos. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to like one of the rules that I set for myself when I was traveling was I started to notice that everyone was just kind of taking the same travel photos and going to the same places. And I set a rule for myself that I don't ever want to take, take or post the same photo that, some, that I've already seen else or that someone else has already taken. So that basically just forced me to look for brand new locations, brand new compositions, and just see the world a little bit differently. And that ultimately makes you stand out way more. So you're not just another photographer that has a million photos of the Dolomites and Banff. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. you actually stand out and you have unique photos. And that's the reason people want to follow you is because you're, they're not going to find those photos anywhere else. So um i think that's one of the main reasons that a lot of brands want to work with me is because it's fresh unique content but then also the storytelling aspect of like being able to tell a three-minute narrative story and actually create something that's a little more impactful than just like a travel montage or something <laughs> totally so that's probably classic. how your like brands also see that who was your first big brand contract or or client so to say first big one was so at the end of 2018 i was i basically just broke actually was it 2018 or yeah end of 2018 i essentially broke even so i was like i made exactly the same amount of money that i spent <laughs> so i was like cool sweet yeah. i guess i keep doing this um but um then at the very end of 2018, Samsung hit me up and they were like, um, we want you to be in Portugal next week. And like, we need, like, they're basically releasing the Galaxy, I think it was the S6 or something at that time. Um, and they wanted me to be the photographer for the whole campaign. Wow. Whoa. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. That's so Meanwhile, cool. I'm in like, I'm in a cave in the mountains in Turkey. <laughs> I'm trying to have these calls, like Skype calls with these Samsung guys in Korea and the Wi-Fi is just non-existent. Mm -hmm. And so we're having to like get my mom involved as like a middleman and trying to like communicate with them. And so I kind of went into the job pretty, like I was confident in my abilities, but I was like, I have no clue what they're wanting. So just kind of had to go for it nice. but it was That's a pretty awesome. good shoot we shot in half in spain half in portugal um and they were like like i don't know why they spent so much money on the shoot but they like they would have seven production vans like they'd have catering hair and makeup yes. casting um like lighting and everything and it would be me it'd be me shooting the whole campaign on a cell phone with oh, oh, beta wow. version of the cell phone so no it was way. like the the camera was terrible on it because they were still coding the camera and they had their head samsung technician in a van behind me and i'd be like yeah it's grainy in the top right corner and then i'd hand the phone to him and he'd like 20 minutes later hand me back a new phone that's updated and a whole different <laughs> model like whole different software on it and he's just like sitting in this van coding and it was yeah it was pretty crazy and they had like this team of Koreans. So they had their head of Sam, head of Samsung global marketing, head of Samsung Europe, head of like just basically the top dogs over at Samsung, um, their like mobile division all on this shoot. So I think the agency in Spain 
wanted to show the Samsung guys that they were actually using the budget that they had given them. So they were doing things like uh -huh. rent out an entire amusement park just to shoot on one roller coaster with a hundred extras. And it was like <laughs> on a cell phone and we didn't even use the photos. It was like just crazy stuff like that. Man, I wish I had the budget like that for something. Yeah. Damn. The photos looked good, but I was kind of taking photos at the same time on my iPhone and iPhone photos were quite a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, guys. <laughs> iPhone. We're going yeah. yeah. to yeah. we're gonna, we're gonna get iPhone to sponsor this podcast just to put that, just yeah. so they can have that clip. <laughs> Funny enough, now I'm an ambassador for Apple, so. Oh, oh no way. <laughs> okay. So you, you have to say this now then, hey? But we don't even know if it's true then. Yeah. Um, but they... Basically, those photos, um, I think they're still around, but you can, if you, at the time, if you went into any um, store selling a Samsung device in the world, the, all the all the photos in the camera roll of the demo phone were all taken by me. So That's they so might cool. still be in Best Buy and stuff. I don't know if, um, <laughs> but they were for they were for the last two years. So how did how did that feel? Like how does it feel? Pretty when cool. Yeah. Like, I remember when it first got released, I was in South Africa, and then I flew to India, and I was, like, going to each airport, uh, like, all the airports have stores selling phones and stuff, and so I'd go into each store and just check the camera rolls, like, <laughs> and then I flew That's to India, awesome. I was like, sweet, <laughs> we're in India, <laughs> like. How, uh, I've got a question, as a travel photographer, how... I mean, obviously now you're sort of, I guess, homebound kind of with your with your injury, but how much of the year would you say you're sort of traveling and how much, because you're, you're originally from here, from BC, I guess this is your home. Um, you know, how much of the year are you actually traveling and how much of it are you here in BC, I guess? Well, so it depends on the year because last year there, it was a bit different, but um, obviously because of COVID and everything, yeah. but like 2019, um, my home base was in Bali in 2019, so... Not a bad place to... <laughs> yeah, that sounds really tough. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was renting a place there for nine months with um, Christian LeBlanc. I don't know if you know him, but he's another Vancouver-based... Or Vancouver originally um, creator, YouTuber. Uh, he, he, he's, yeah, he lost... Well, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So he and I had a place down there with a couple others, and... I was like based out of there, but I wasn't there that often. And I was traveling like pretty much 100% of the year. Like I didn't take any downtime cause it was, so it's fun. And yeah, yeah. yeah sure. my downtime was in Bali. So it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't too bad. And then uh, COVID hit and like I did three or four trips at the beginning of the year before COVID hit and then basically just stopped traveling and that was kind of like, it's been kind of nice because I've never really explored Vancouver or BC as much as I have now. Yeah. Um, Cause like, I was always just looking at the next adventure and the next thing to do. So um, it's been good having time to just slow down and, and try and shoot as much as I can here. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I know in the, in the beginning of COVID or towards the beginning, you were actually doing tons of scuba diving. I remember seeing, Tons and tons of scuba diving. So how, how did that come to be? You just decided you want to go scuba diving one day or do you already have your license from like Bali, I'm guessing or something? Well, so my friend Zach and I, you know, down to film on Instagram. Yeah. So he and I, we kind of made a thing last summer and we're going to try and do it again this summer of just trying to get, we call it adventure certified. So just trying to do as much, get as many certifications as possible. So he's beating me right now. He got his pilot certification, skydive, and then we did our scuba dive together. So, um, so I just cool. did my avalanche training. Um, I want to get my wilderness first aid after doing this to myself. <laughs> um, and then eventually I want to get skydive and then possibly pilot's license as well. Yeah. But I was, yeah. I'm a skydive. Yeah, so it's bad. just, yeah, just trying to get adventure certified is what we're going after right now <laughs> I, like, yeah, got, I like that got our like advanced that. drone licenses and stuff and but um yeah scuba diving though is because i started free diving back in like 2018 i started free diving with chelsea and then 2019 i went from being able to hold my breath for like 
45 seconds to three minutes underwater and going from shooting with a GoPro to a 1DX Mark II and a full Nauticam housing and stuff. So underwater photography just kind of, like I became obsessed with it because it's so cool. And being underwater, especially free diving is one of the most meditative things and like the most magical experience you can have, especially when like the stuff you see underwater is just insane. Um, like diving in Tahiti and you have like sound from a, like humpback whales singing all around you and it's wow. like vibrating your body because the sound is so loud and it's yeah just crazy experiences like that that you don't get anywhere else in the world and it also comes back to like that need to create content that nobody else can recreate because yeah. like that's one of the main reasons I love free diving is all those moments underwater are never you can never recreate those moments yeah. and everything feels brand new and just so exciting and so like by free diving like you're taking images that no one's ever going to recreate and everything's unique underwater so i think that's one of the coolest things about it that's so cool so i have a question i i ask this from every single guest um, and I'm really curious what you're going to say, because by the sound of it, you haven't been really, you know, be making any big business mistakes. But is there anything that you're, gonna, you're thinking back and it's like, shit, I messed that up pretty badly. Like shoot wise, <laughs> client wise, whatever wise. Um, I don't know. I oftentimes, like if something's not going well, I, I just kind of. I treat things more of a challenge than anything else. Mm -hmm. Like obviously there's things that you can mess up and it just really screws up everything. But I haven't, I don't know if I've really run into anything that's been super bad for, <laughs> super bad for myself, for my career yet. I'm sure something's gonna happen, but. Yeah. Not, not, yeah. Knock, knock on wood that nothing yeah. happens, man, <laughs> knock on wood. <laughs> I usually see the things that do happen as um, more of a learning experience and more of a challenge to, like just constantly try and improve there's like obviously little things like accidentally deleting an entire shoot off a hard drive or something or like i was on a shoot in hawaii with tentry and I accidentally elbowed the hard drive which had the entire week's worth of shoots on it off the table and completely oh. just <laughs> Oh my God. Okay, well, that, that sounds pretty good. Did you good. just yeah. end up staying in Hawaii for an extra week? Oh no. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it was like a shoot with three models, a stylist and art design yeah. and for a week and <laughs> elbowed most of the photos off the desk. Um, <laughs> like there's stuff like that that happens, but I wouldn't consider that to be a big, um, like a big setback. Um, do you consider yourself um, a good business person? So like, and, and yeah, and my question would be like, how did you learn? Is that, does that come from your family as well? Uh, no, <laughs> my family is very much in the creative side of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely not the best business person. Um, I've, um, I've like, I guess that could be one of the bigger set or bigger setbacks is like not knowing what to charge and just getting taken advantage of by brands, I guess, from the start. Mm -hmm. And then now I have a much better understanding of how it all works. Um, like, yeah, I think like I, I had a hundred thousand followers and I was still making no money from Instagram. Like it was like, I just had no clue how it worked. Yeah. Um, I was still doing free trips and stuff. And like, usually like you can make a full-time living with under 10,000 followers. If you tried hard enough, but I just had no clue how it worked. Yeah. But I think part of that is mostly, or I think part of that is because I never really focus on the money side of things. I'm always focusing on the photography side and doing it because I love to do it, not because I want to make a bunch of money. Yeah. And that's kind of the only way you can look at it if you like, if you're going to try and become a content creator. Unless like depends, I guess, travel content creator. There's obviously other ways of like other genres. But yeah, you kind of have to be obsessive about it and super passionate to actually stand out and make, make your work good enough to be noticed by a lot of people. 
I think that's that's something that's super important. Um, like for for me at least that I like noticed in the last little bit. Um, because like being like a full time creative and like running this as a business, sometimes like I get caught up so much of just like it's a business, it's a business. I gotta gotta message the client, gotta get this video for the client where a lot of like the personal side of things that I like to do gets kind of pushed aside. So I've been really trying to focus on, you know, creating more, more stuff that I want to do instead of just like always editing, like sitting in the office and editing a video for somebody else or, you know, editing photos, for somebody else. It's like, Hey, you know, like this weekend I'm going on this trip. I'm going to bring my gimbal and my camera. I'm going to, I'm going to make a bunch of reels or I'm going to make a, like a cool little video or I'm going to take some like really cool photos and, I've just been like really, really tying back and like enjoying being a creative again, which I'm, I'm really, really happy about. And the key that I've found is doing jobs that are like um, doing jobs that make you feel fulfilled and doing jobs that you're stoked about and like have on your, like you can post on your main feed and like it's an ad, but it doesn't feel like an ad and you don't feel like you're taking away from your brand or anything by posting it. So like that DJI video or the Corona videos that I do, like those are all videos that I'd post anyway. They just happen to have a bit of like product placement thrown in there. Yeah. yeah. That's actually, actually another thing. How did you get Corona as a client? That's so, <laughs> like, I'm so jealous, man. Like that's awesome. Yeah. Well, so they like pretty much all my clients are like just from them reaching out to me most of the time, because a lot of times I like can't keep up with the, the emails that come in um just because like if you ever email in a in your bio you just end up getting hammered with emails um but i like it's i'm very fortunate to be able to be picky like that and be able to pick and choose through which through which jobs i want to i want to actually take on and the corona jobs are cool because they are initially reached out to me um well actually the head of corona marketing he used to work at beautiful destinations. So um, he knew my work from there. Um, not that I've worked with beautiful destinations, but I'm friends with all of them over there. So he reached out to me and they wanted to start this um, like Corona studios thing and get a bunch of creators filming uh, short, like three minute videos for them on a bunch of different stories. And um, they, they kind of came to me with like, they were like, we want you to be the first video. Like we want you to make the first video, um, pitch us on a cool story and go make it. And so, cool. okay, let's go do something. So um, they, since it was the first video, they gave us a pretty good budget. So we were able to go, we flew to Borneo and we did a whole project. It's called Dive Reflex it was the film. And we went and free dove in Borneo for a week. And we had me, Josiah, Gordon, Chelsea Kawhi, and Lexi Limitless. And we basically just filmed this video on what our experience with freediving is and how it impacts our lives above, <clears throat> above water. And while we were down there, we just happened to have the most insane conditions like ever. And we like we had at one point we were diving with seven whale sharks and a big surrounding a big bait ball of fish and we had Whoa. it was just insane and we're like Josiah and Chelsea and I are just like what the like what the hell is happening and <laughs> like we yeah diving with jellyfish and um, just in these crazy underwater caves and stuff and it was the coolest place ever and the footage was amazing and we we basically like Corona gave me full creative freedom on it and they were just like, create something cool. Awesome. And so we did that and uh, they loved it. The video, we posted the video and it got like, I think 3 million views on Corona's channels in the first week. So and the viewership, awesome. like the, the viewer uh, retention rate was like 60% or something crazy, which doesn't like, it's usually like that's 10% huge. for yeah, videos. Yeah, that's yeah. huge. And so, that was pretty cool because then Corona was like, okay, this actually works. And so they basically have given me pretty much pretty good creative freedom on most of our jobs since then. Um, and it's kind of funny because I would make a video 
with some new concept and then I'd see like three more Corona videos come out in the next two months with a very similar concept to the one that we just made. <laughs> they're, they're kind of like, Oh, this is a good idea. Let's tell our other instructor or other creators to do something similar. Um, but yeah, the only one that they said no to was Chelsea and I made uh, lady of the sea, which was this one that we did in Tahiti. And um, we, that was originally a Corona video. Okay. And we had we had some Corona branding in there and stuff, and we sent it to them. They're like, "It's really cool, but it has nothing to do with Corona." <laughs> <laughs> they were like, "This is a little too far out there." We're like, "Okay, fair," which I'm kind of glad about because um, it it kind of like I think that film's a lot stronger without any brand placement in it. Yeah, yeah, it's that pretty, was an awesome film. Yeah, it was pretty unreal. Yeah, loved it. Pretty unreal. And then the the flow state video that was because corona said no to the to lady of the sea so we had to dig up a bunch of old footage and piece it together with a brand new narrative and that's what the flow state video was <laughs> hey you know it works it, it works, works. <laughs> that's, that's awesome, awesome. <laughs> yeah. that's hey, awesome it looks like you like you're it feels like to me anyways that you're kind of like paving the way you know in a new creative di direction for a lot of other creatives and with that, like, how do you see yourself? Like, where do you see yourself in five to 10 years? Where are you going? Um, I want to get more into directing films. So yeah. like eventually down the road, I want to do feature length films, but I don't think that'll be within five years. Um, honestly, within five years, I still want to be traveling and doing what I'm doing now because there's so much to see and it's quite a lot of fun. Um, I want to see where creator circuit goes because I think creator circuit like teaching is another one of like I love teaching yeah. it helps me to like when I'm feeling if I'm feeling burnt out which I've only really felt burnt out once teaching was the thing that really brought me back from that and re like kind of re-spark the fire um, so I think I want to see where creator circuit goes I think there's a lot of really cool potential with it um, and yeah, just getting that out there as much as possible. Great. That's cool. awesome. That's awesome. Um, I had a question. Uh, I don't know if how much you can share or not, but I don't know. And obviously with your injury right now, you're sort of stuck, but um, do you have any sort of cool projects in the pipeline that you could kind of give us a hint or like share with us? Well, so I've got another passion project coming out probably, uh, when is it? So it'll come out probably May 7th or 8th. Um, it's Chelsea and I, so I, I wrote the script while in COVID lockdown. I was like, I just had so much free time and I was like, I'm just going to put some brain power towards writing something, writing a short story of like a short film kind of script. And so um, I wrote this short script called Voyager and it's about the Voyager spacecrafts and how, do you know the story with the Voyager spacecrafts? So it's these two satellites that NASA um, launched in the 60s originally to go, I think one was going around Saturn. I forget what the other one was doing, but they also attached these big gold records, like a vinyl record, but made of gold um, to the sides of the spacecraft. And um, the records on them have, I think it's like 60, 60 sounds or something um, from earth. So it's, what the scientists at the time, I think it was Carl Sagan and his wife were leading the team, but is the sounds that they deemed to be some of the most beautiful sounds on earth. And they have sounds from ranging from like a mother's first words to her newborn child, to volcano eruptions, to the sounds of the ocean, to elephants, to like lightning and thunder and uh, laughter and just all these really cool, like unique sounds to earth. Yeah. in the hopes that maybe someday an alien will find the spacecraft and be able to listen to earth or it's preserving a little piece of earth mm -hmm. and so um the satellites after they did, did their mission around saturn they just sent them off into deep into deep space and so the satellite now is like i forget how many billions of miles away it is from earth but it's fully out of the solar system now um and it's the farthest object humans have ever created, like farthest from Earth. Um, and the cool part is the records have a shelf life of over a billion years. So 
Earth is going to be a charred, ashy ball of nothingness, and these gold records are still going to be floating out there in space, um, which is pretty cool. It's like the last remnant of Earth. So this short film is based on, um, so the the it starts off with these two friends on a sailboat talking to each other, um, and it's Chelsea and my friend Rachel, and it's Chelsea she's like have you heard of the voyager records and she goes on and explains the that whole concept that i just explained to you but obviously mm -hmm. quite a lot better and um the film kind of like adds visuals to the to the sounds that are on the record because i have so many i have so much footage that i just haven't really used from a lot of these places i've been and we've obviously we've also shot some footage for the video but um We've yeah put I put all the visuals to the sounds on the record and cool. so we've got stuff like the humpback whales singing and lightning and thunderstorms and uh, volcanoes erupting and big waves and cool. the forest and elephants playing and stuff. Yeah, that's such a cool that's idea. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. It's actually really inspiring. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, so yeah cool. we'll this makes me want to go travel. We'll definitely <laughs> be on the lookout for, for that video when it comes out. Um, and it, next week i guess or a couple of weeks um yeah, yeah um honestly this this podcast could go on for hours if i'm being quite honest i could talk <laughs> to you for hours so you should probably probably wrap up the recording um just about here but if you want to hang out after and chat a little bit afterwards we'd love to um but yeah anyways um this That's, been awesome. yeah this is this has been awesome yeah, been awesome. yeah, yeah. like we really really appreciate it. like Man, like, honestly, you, you don't even realize, like, how excited I was when you answered my DM, by the way. <laughs> like, I was, like, called Sam right away. I was yeah. like, dude. So, well, I saw your DM. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then I didn't really read your username or anything. And just completely, like, I mentally, I put a mental note in, like, April 28th. Sweet. And then just complete, I was like, oh, like, fuck, I got so many DMs. I had no clue <laughs> where to find your DM. I was like, oh, no, I hope he messages me. So luckily yeah. he messaged me. Yeah, I know. Yeah, before before we started this recording, it was a whole a whole fiasco. I'm trying to get the right Zoom link going. Yeah, no, it was funny because I was in the office. Lucas was at home, and then uh, I got a phone call for him from him. And usually, when he calls me, it's about like a client or something or whatever you know. And he was super excited, and he's like, "Guess what?" I'm like, in my head, I'm like, "Oh, we probably landed a, a client, a cool client or something," you know. Yeah. Um, and he's like. We're getting Emmett Sparning on the podcast. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, my roommate like opened his door after he was like, dude, that sounds really cool. Who's Emmett? <laughs> Cause I was like, I was like, yeah, let's go. No, so it was, it was really funny, but yeah. Um, anyways, tying back to any of this podcast, like I was going to yeah. say, <laughs> um, Emmett, do you have anything that you want to shout out or anything that you just really want like more people to like know about? Um, like creatively or something I'm doing what, whatever you want man either or whatever both. you want well I've already talked about creator circuit so that's that's the thing I'll <laughs> I'd be promoting um, but I think just trying to like keeping things original like don't get don't get scared of um, like I don't know um, how can I articulate this like a lot of times people are get bogged down to trying to post on Instagram and they often overthink everything. And I like from the start, I set a rule for myself that I would try and post every single day. And like, that's a pretty big undertaking, but it's, it's how you're going to get better because by posting every day, you need a big amount of content to be able to fuel that. And by having a big amount of content, it means you're shooting a lot more and by shooting a lot more, it means you're practicing a lot. And so, the only way of getting better is going to be by practicing and people often forget that and they always they ask how i'm able to travel full time and how like why are my photos so good and whatever it's only because i've put in the hours and put in the work and there's i can tell you firsthand there is nobody with followers in the travel space that hasn't put in the work and put in the hours to to get where they are get where they are um and you kind of have to be obsessive about it you have to be just super passionate about it and just dive headfirst into creating as much content as you possibly can trying as many different styles of photography as you can 
like I started with macro photography and I went into portraits and then started doing landscapes. And like recently I've been doing a lot more car photo shoots and like just really trying to tackle every single type of photography you can and not trying to shy away from anything. And I think that's what is going to make you stand out as a creator and as a business, whatever it may be, is just putting in those hours and really getting good at something. Don't worry about your gear. You can take good photos on whatever gear you have. You just have to really be focused on like learning how it all works and getting good composition, working with light. Um, yeah. And I guess if you want to learn how to do all that, creator circuit. <laughs> <laughs> right there. There we go. All righty, boom. Nicely done. All right. All right. That final, that final plug in there. We're going to wrap this up. Um, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Emmett. Uh, this has been the Breakdown Podcast for Creative Talk Business and Life. That was Emmett Sparling. Make sure you check out the creator circuit. If you are a creative that is just up and coming and learning, you want to learn some really cool things. Um, I'm your co-host, Lucas. Vicky. And I'm Sam. And then that's also Emmett. And we will see you guys next week. <laughs> <laughs>